I, I, I don't know how we do this. I, I don't know if I want to do this, but uh, all right, just bear with, OK? Uh, a, bit, a bit of stream of consciousness. Well, it's always stream of consciousness. But let me talk to you briefly about where some of the inspiration is coming from. So let's begin with a tweet off a mate, with a message off a mate last night. Um, just just sort of things things to think about, things that might make you think. Uh, you're probably well aware of this already, mate, but um, we were just taken off a flight from Porto because the British end was unable to handle a scheduled inbound flight full mainly of Brits from our oldest global ally. The couple next to us with a baby had been trying to get via London to Dubai for two days, and then he uses some rather Anglo-Saxon language and wonders whether I'm aware of the extent of the problem because of the, the, the job that I do for a living. So you, you have a little look at flights, cancellations. BA cancelled 10,000, I think, yesterday at Heathrow in the coming months. Gatwick yesterday announced that everything's going to be getting back to normal and 10 minutes later announced the cancellation, I think, of 26 flights because so many air traffic control people were off sick. So staff shortages continue to... Um, uh, uh, it, it, it impact upon that sector. Then you've got the front page of uh, the City AM newspaper, which is, I mean, it literally describes itself on the masthead as London's business newspaper. It's its quite good these days. It used to be an absolute skip fire. Um, I forget the name of the bloke that used to edit it, but he was a hardcore Brexiter. Imagine being a financial journalist and being pro-Brexit. It speaks of an ignorance on a level that would probably get you a job in in the cabinet. So the front page of City AM today is bad news. This is it. They've just put bad news in, in, in four inch high big black letters. Bad news, pages two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. And then good news, crossed cross rail to fully open in November, which is relatively good news if you're a commuter working in London. That, that's not a joke. I, that, I mean, that, that is it. You, I think they may have nicked the idea off us. I don't know if you remember last week, we announced that we were going to start the programme every day with some good news. And by the second day of the scheme, of the plan, we couldn't find any. So we had to drop the feature uh, even before it had begun. But that's, that's City AM, London's business newspaper. Bad news, pages 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Good news, Crossrail 2, fully open in November. And then, because I work very hard on your behalf, as we have discussed recently, uh, putting in proper sort of coal miner-style shifts for you on a daily basis, I also consult, when I can, some... Um, uh, uh, foreign media. In fact, I usually I get sent links to relevant stories by my brilliant listeners and some of my now in excess of one million Twitter followers. So this is from France's, I think it's a newspaper of record, Le Monde. I, I, I don't know whether this is relevant, but it all seems to me to speak to a similar theme. You go to the editorial of, of Le Monde published um, uh, just yesterday, and th there's a link. You can just press read in English. Did you know that? To, to read the editorials of, of, of one of the best-selling newspapers in France, just press a button, you can read it all in English. I shouldn't have told you that, should I? I should have pretended I was translating it on site from uh, from, from the original. So the, the headline is, The UK's downturn is a warning for Europe. The focus on ideology over pragmatism in response to the worst crisis in the country since the 1970s risks aggravating the deteriorating situation left by Boris Johnson and feeding the temptation to deploy anti-European and nationalist rhetoric. I'll read you a little bit more, actually, because, uh, you know, God won't... I get it wrong every day. God grant... No, won't the gift the gifty gears to see ourselves as others see us, as the great Scottish bard almost wrote. In the absence of economic shock buffers, the United Kingdom's population is often more affected by financial crises than elsewhere on the European continent. And I guess the economic shock buffers that we lack are consequences probably of 12 years of Tory rule and the uh, tyranny of these ludicrous uh, self-styled think tanks that refuse to tell us who funds them but pop up all over the telly all the time telling us that we should be doing even more to help businesses make even more money while not introducing things like a £15 an hour minimum wage. Anyway, the economic and social storm that is brewing across the channel confirms this observation. That phrase there, just look at it. The economic and social storm that is brewing across the channel confirms this observation. 
the British are enduring the worst price increases of the G7 countries. The cost of food is soaring, while the cost of energy will have almost tripled in one year. Add in the damage of Brexit and COVID-19, and the UK threatens to regress to looking like an emerging market, said the Danish bank Saxo. The leaders of the National Health Service have even come out of their shells to warn about the risk of a humanitarian crisis linked to the impoverishment of the population. There it is. French newspaper reporting on on this country and probably paying more attention to what the Danish bank has said about our economy and what the leaders of our National Health Service have said about the state of the national health and most of the right wing media. The leaders of the National Health Service have even come out of their shells to warn about the risk of a humanitarian crisis linked to the impoverishment of the population. Where do you start with this? Um, Barristers, of course, are on strike. Young criminal barristers are planning to quit over poor pay because this government doesn't really like the rule of law. It doesn't really like this brand of Brexity conservatism has to continue to deny reality for reasons I don't need to explain to you anymore. Liz Truss today um, refusing to confirm that she will actually have an ethics advisor because we all saw what can happen to a prime minister when you have an ethics advisor. You you, you have to sack them when it, or you have to watch them resign when it when it emerges that you have actually not got any ethics. So she's, she's cutting out the middleman, going straight for the ethics-free um, administration. And, and of course, the, the, the system of justice, the very essence of democracy is our, is our judicial system, and the poorest people in the country are not going to have access to it if things continue as they are, which I suspect people like Dominic Raab would, would welcome. I often wonder with Dominic Raab, because he trained as a lawyer, as far as I can tell, his legal career didn't go terribly well, and I think he has dedicated his political career to wreaking revenge on the legal profession. I think what you have there is a petulant little failed lawyer who didn't get the big contracts or the big jobs that he was expecting and therefore has dedicated most of his political life to, well, on the one hand, being a plum of epic proportions and on the other hand, trying to get his revenge on all those lawyers who actually are good at the job, Um, even the ones that are working for relative pittances because they at least are doing what they set out to do. Pubs. Last orders as seven in ten pubs warn that they will not survive the winter. This is pubs being driven towards extinction by soaring energy bills. As many as seven in ten saying that they will not survive the winter. It might seem trivial. We can live without a pub. Um, What about care workers? Epic problems in in the care sector now with, with staff shortages. Supermarkets now paying more than care workers receive. Almost 400,000 care workers are earning less than supermarket workers as a staffing crisis engulfs the sector. That's from the King's Fund. Uh, NHS, A&E, you've read about the ambulance pauses. You've read about delays, rather. You've read about... um, uh, 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 the delays in A&E. You've probably been to a hospital and done a double take at the poster on the wall about how long it's going to take you to be seen. You know, four hours for an illness, eight hours for an injury, or was it the other way around? Eight hours for an illness, four hours for an injury on a on a on a A&E department that I was in in the last two weeks. <laughs> Schools with with roofs falling in, and and I don't know what to do. Really, I I, I don't. I mean, we come on air every day, and I noticed probably last week or certainly last month, beginning of this month, I I just began to notice that we were getting a bit Groundhog Day. All that changes is the sector. What are we going to talk about today? Let's. Are we going to talk about what's happening in the pub sector? How bad is it? And then my phones ring off the hook with people telling me that they're facing, um, they're facing uh, imminent oblivion. Uh, what's happening in the care home sector? And then people ring me from the care home sector and tell me that they're facing imminent oblivion. People running businesses which have energy bills to pay, looking at the projected payments that they're going to be expected to take, looking also at continuing staff shortages. The hospitality sector, we've done that recently, haven't we? Yes, we have. We've done the hospitality sector. People ringing us to tell us they're facing existential threat. All before the energy price hikes kick in in the coming months. I, I mean... I'm not joking when I say, where would you point for something that's going well? I imagine bailiffs are having a good time of it at the moment. I don't know. Where where, where would you go to find something going well? And Dave's already complaining. And you're right, actually. That's just not right, James. Living without a pub is a life not worth living. I I remain a huge fan of pubs. I hate these stories about pubs closing, but I recognise that in the great scheme of things, care homes are more important. 
in many ways, most ways, all ways. So, I, I mean, listen, if you're a racist, then obviously me reading from a French newspaper will have set fire to your hair already this morning. So come back to London and have a look at the front page of City AM, okay? Bad news, page two, three, four, five, six, seven, and 8. And, and then, you know, the mail now having some sort of weird hissy fit about the disgusting Rwandan scheme, which everybody with a functioning brain could have told you and in fact did tell you from the very start, was doomed to fail because it's not designed to solve a problem. It's designed to delight nasty people. And then perhaps, perhaps the, the weirdest little Petri dish of punditry that this country has ever endured now would be the comment pages of the Daily Telegraph newspaper. And you know it pains me to say this because it's my late father's newspaper and it was a, a, a you know, it was the paper of record. It was a magnificent newspaper for most of the time that my dad worked on it under the legendary newspaper editor Sir Bill Deeds. But just think for a minute... If you listen, I mean this. All the racists who hated me reading out from a French newspaper. This is the Daily Telegraph. This is the newspaper that is to Boris Johnson as the Beano is to Dennis the Menace. Okay? They, they are inextricably intertwined. And you have a comment writer here. The main comment piece, the main op-ed in the Daily Telegraph. Britain is broken and nobody can be bothered to do anything about it. This is the ideological home of the people who have spent 12 years telling you that the right people are in charge. This is the ideological home of the people who told you that David Cameron would be a most excellent prime minister. But then they told you that Brexit would be a most excellent idea and therefore Theresa May, once Boris Johnson had dropped out of the race, would be a most excellent prime minister. And then they told you that Theresa May was an awful prime minister and that she must be replaced by Boris Johnson. So she was replaced by Boris Johnson and they continued to tell you that these were the perfect people to run the country and the perfect policies to pursue. Most obviously, Brexit and austerity from those three prime ministers, from Cameron, May and Johnson. You'd go for Brexit and austerity. Those were the perfect policies for these people to pursue and absolutely the right people were in power. It's almost as if the, the, the needle has jumped on the record. They go, the right people are in power and we are pursuing the perfect policies. The right people are in power and we are pursuing the perfect policies. The right people are in power and we're pursuing the perfect policies. <laughs> needle jump. Britain is broken and nobody can fix it. How dare they? I mean, seriously. How dare right-wing newspapers? City AM, I know it's got a different editor. But they have spent 12 years telling us that austerity is good and Brexit is good. And now the consequences of putting these political uh, numpties in charge are coming home to roost. It's incredible. Come on. Oh, come on, James. Stop being so doomster gloomster. Jacob Rees-Mogg has said that some of his city friends are doing quite well. I mean, what do we do? How does it work? I, I mean, genuinely, what, you've got the Daily Telegraph comment pages literally stating Britain is broken and nobody can be bothered to fix it. And here we are. What are we going to talk about? Death trap dinghies again? I mean, is that is that what they're going to throw to you in the hope of distracting you from the situation that is unfolding on your high streets, in your homes, in your businesses, in your hospitals, in your care homes? I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. Here's a good one. Here, I'm sick to death of James O'Brien and his negativity. Well, give me a ring and tell me what to be positive about then, chum. Seriously. Get someone to teach you how to use a phone and give me a call. It's quite incredible. And, and it's not coming from The Guardian or The Daily Mirror or from, or from me. Uh, shielding families, front of the Financial Times, shielding, shielding families from fuel bill shock reckoned to cost £100 billion. And what did the Daily Mail have on its front page last week? A story about £1 million, which is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the figure on the front page of the Financial Times, being spent on some training schemes in the NHS. We, we are, I think, close to becoming a failed state. I really do. And I don't want... I mean, I bloody live here. This is, this, is, this is the only country I've ever wanted to live in. It's the only country I've ever lived in. It's where I am raising my family. It's where I love to live. And I'm insulated from a lot of these problems. But it honestly feels as if we are heading towards another cliff edge while everybody or many, many people are pretending that it's going brilliantly. I don't get it. I guess the question then is, do you? Do you get it? Can you make sense of this for me? Because 
Every now and then, I told you when I got back from my last holiday, I know what you're thinking. It, it sounds like one of those days where he's not going to take any calls at all. Just when you think the monologue is coming to an end, he goes off on an entirely different tangent. And you know what? You're right. I told you when I got back from my last holiday, which is, again, evidence of how insulated I am from a lot of the problems that you might be facing. I still, still have foreign holidays. And I talked about cogs and how... If you do this for a living, you're a cog in the machine, even if you don't realise it. When I turn, something else turns. Daily Mail once reported on, on a decline in the number of people following me on Twitter after Elon Musk had announced he was going to buy the company. You are a cog in the wheel, whether you want to be or not. And I got back from holiday and I somehow felt as if I'd, I'd, the cog had come out. Yeah, Tony Dickin, that Daily Express journalists are going on strike. Daily Express journalists ordered by their bosses to write about how strikers are militant saboteurs who are bringing this country to its knees are having to go on strike themselves to get a decent wage. Ho-hum. And you get the cog out of the machine. And, and it gives you a perspective. You can see what's going on. And it's just hideous. But, but there's, a, there's a sense of denial. There's a sense of delusion, perhaps. A sense of, I don't know what it is. But I know that when the worst right wing opinion merchants in the country start talking after 12 years of telling us, of 12 years of getting their own way, of getting their own people into positions of power, of getting their own poverty uh, producing policies pushed across the line, getting austerity pushed across the line, getting Brexit pushed across the line. When they start talking about Britain being broken and our closest geographical ally, France, is looking over the channel with a sense of utter bewilderment and fear because they worry that this might presage problems for other countries as well, then I don't get it. Do you? 03456060973. I hate, hate, hate this question. I hate it. But I've got to ask it today. How bad is everything? 03456060973. Do you know what Liz Truss was talking about last night at yet another flipping hustings? How she would be perfectly prepared to press the nuclear button because she thinks it's a very important part of the Prime Minister's duties. <laughs> Sorry, what pardon? How bad is it? Convince me that it isn't. Don't send me texts complaining about the truth. Seriously, you've been doing that ever since you voted for Brexit. Just, just tell me what you're cheerful about. Tell me what there is about a country where everything from a hospital to your local pub is facing existential threat that is worth celebrating. And then look me in the eye and tell me how the hell the people who've spent 12 years telling us to put him in charge, put her in charge, put him in charge, pursue this policy, pursue that policy, pursue this policy, are now turning around, clutching their pearls, throwing their hands in the air and going, oh, tatty hilarious, everything is broken and nobody's prepared to fix it. It's beyond pathetic. It's actually tragic. Except perhaps it isn't. 03456060973. Here you go. What's going on? What's going on? How did it happen? It's 10.21. I do apologise. That's excessive even by my standards. <laughs> 